Well, howdy folks, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, thanks for joining. And welcome to the Desert Precision Gun Works shop. Folks that follow my channel, if you don't know, I am a custom rifle manufacturer, home-based FFL out of Lake Havasu, Arizona. My wife is the boss in home and in the business. <laughs> Today's video is a highly requested one. I had a lot of folks uh, reach out to me and ask me to show the process of how I make these stupid, ridiculous, accurate rifles. Now, there's a difference, in my opinion, um, a dying art, so to say, between a hand-fitted operation versus a assembled, pre-fitted rifle. Now, a lot of folks say they're, quote unquote, building a rifle, and they throw that term loosely. Assembling is not building. So today's video, I wanted to show you guys a process of building a six arc bolt action rifle. I have a Zermac Arms origin action that we will be building today in six arc. And we have a contoured blank. Now this is a contoured blank, big old truck axle, contour number eight from Douglas Barrels. I highly recommend using them. They are a awesome company, really easy to talk to. Like I mentioned, Contour 8, which is basically a MTU contour, a true MTU contour, which ends at one inch at the muzzle. Now this is a four groove design, so it's not the typical traditional six groove. Uh, they are a button rifle company. So we're gonna turn this barrel, and I'm gonna show you guys the process of little tips and tricks that I do that, that take a half inch rifle shooter to a sub half inch rifle shooter. And those little details in the hand fitted operation, which I'll show you today, is exactly what gets this thing to be stupid accurate. Well folks, stay tuned, you might like this one, you might learn something. As always, I'm always open to feedback, suggestions, comments, so I'll drop a line below during the video. Well, let's get to it. Well folks, here's what we're gonna be operating today. This is a Shop Fox M1112. It's basically a Grizzly gunsmithing lathe, um, but is Shop Fox name brand. Now this is an outstanding lathe, uh, really good value for the money and it's extremely accurate actually the tail stock the tail stock to the head alignment is down to one ten thousandths of an inch now i do have to put a disclaimer out there i am not a professional gunsmith i am not certified to do what i do my certifications are based off my clients performance and their happiness so things like this really help me out it really motivate me to keep doing what i do so much appreciation there uh, for folks that send little gifts like this Folks that actually email me their results. And like I mentioned, my certification is based off the accuracy and the happiness of my clients. We build rifles specifically designed to exceed your expectations. I personally sit down with the client and talk to them discussing exactly what their intentions are, what their philosophy of use is, and basically try to build a rifle that will exceed what they want. So contrary to popular belief, uh, squaring up in action, for instance, a Remington 700 is not blueprinting in action. Blueprints mean a design plan or some kind of measurements in a plan and uh, if you're not putting those measurements after squaring up in action, that is not blueprinting. Today I'm going to show you guys basically what it takes and what I do, uh, which I believe is blueprinting. And even though these things are a pretty precise action, the Bighorn RD3, uh, which is basically the origin action, um, the measurements do differ within a couple thousands to up to eight thousands which entails actually your headspace measurement. So, like I mentioned, I build these barrels specifically to the action. Uh, those deviations of four to eight thousandths could be a difference between a go and no-go gauge. So you could basically technically have a barrel that's supposedly a pre-fit shouldered barrel that will not headspace correctly. So, like I mentioned, it is a huge benefit to get the measurements on the action and go off of that measurement. All right, so the Zermak Arms Origin Action. What is this action? Well, it's made by ZAI, Zermak Arms Incorporated, and it's a center round feed Remington 700 footprint action. Now, the difference between the Origin Action versus the TL3 is that the Origin Action does not have an integral recoil lug, but it has all the benefits and the accuracy, in my opinion, uh, as a TL3. There is a slight advantage with the TL3 with a rigidity and tighter bolt feel, but this is a uh, black nitride coated action, and in my opinion, is one of the best bang for the value out there. Now, if you're looking to build a custom rifle, these things run $875 for a custom action. Like I mentioned, 700 footprint, Remington 700 footprint. Like I mentioned, this is a center round feed action, otherwise known as a control round feed, which means that the ejector, it's a little small ejector, if you guys can see 
down in there, a little arm that sticks out, and basically that allows you to control your ejection of your, uh, your cartridge. The difference between this and the push feed, which I'll take this apart, is that this action um, doesn't pick up the cartridge off the nose of the bolt. Now, it does have a slot cut out, which in my opinion is uh, makes this thing a hell of a lot more reliable. So it's kind of like a Mauser. Uh, it, it allows you to have uh, full control and better reliability on feeding a cartridge into the chamber. So this thing does use a free floating bolt head. Uh, this action is actually, uh, like I said, a 700 footprint, but it does utilize the same tenon as a Savage. So yes, a lot of folks buy these actions and then buy a Savage prefit and basically assemble a rifle together. Um, but there's a couple tips that we're gonna go over today, which I'll show you guys when I'm building this barrel that makes this thing a hell of a lot more rigid and gets that half inch shooter down to a quarter inch or near a quarter inch at least. First measurement we need to take is the tenon length. So we're gonna count for two thousandths of crush. Now this being a, uh, like I said, a uh, detachable recoil lug, there's still a little bit of leeway and give on this, um, including the threads of the barrel. What I use for that is a eye gauging digital depth gauge. And um, I have on here a flat foot, which I did notch out for the ejectors for some of the, um, the actions that I play with. But um, first thing we gotta do is remove the actual firing pin. So that way that doesn't get in the way and give us a false measurement. And it's pretty simple in this action. You actually just take the bolt off and rotate it counterclockwise until it pops up like that. And you can remove the whole firing pin assembly. Now this is a benefit of this action. You can actually change out the bolt heads very easy by popping this pin off um, and buying yourself a different bolt head. So they offer a PPC bolt head and they offer a 308 and also a Magnum as well. So this is a, another benefit of this action. So we have the firing pin off. Let me get this back together. Very tight tolerances here. There we go. Put the firing pin away. It's got a little uh, lube from the factory. The springs and stuff on that firing pin are specifically designed uh, from Zermac Arms to utilize the Trigger Tech triggers. Um, but we'll go over that later on. So we got us, uh, ourselves a disassembled bolt. Just be careful with the pin, make sure it doesn't fall down in there. And we're gonna basically find the tenon measurement. About 900 thousandths. Uh, yeah, there we go, 900 thousandths. And that is basically gonna be our max tenon length. All right, so using our blueprint here, um, basically it's a mock-up design, 900 thousandths is our max tenon length. And like I mentioned, we have a 2 thousandths of crush factor we need to factor in. What I like to do is give a total of 5 thousandths of clearance so that gives us roughly three thousandths between the bolt face and the actual um, uh, breech of the uh, barrel here. So 900 thousandths minus five is gonna be 895. That is gonna be our tenon length that we're gonna go for. And we're gonna thread this tenon length at a one and one sixteenth 20 TPI. So basically a 1.025 inch OD and 20 th inches per thread. All right, next uh, dimension we're gonna get is the uh, bolt face to the um, front of the action or the recoil lug and that's going to give us the gap in which will give us our go gauge protrusion 1.020 so one inch and 20 thousandths um, and we'll get that measurement written down here so one inch and 20 thousandths from the bolt face to the front of the recoil lug is what we measure right and we found out that the top of the bolt head to the front of the recoil lug is 900 thousandths now to get our our go gauge protrusion, which essentially is our headspace, we're going to take 1.200. We do know that our tendon length is 5 thousandths less than 900 thousandths, so 895. You know, I am Asian, but I'm not good in math. <laughs> Funny, huh? Uh, we'll get a simple calculator here. One point. Um, oops, I put 200 thousandths. Zero two zero. Let's fix that. That would have been quite a quite a big difference there. All right, one hundred one inch and twenty thousandths minus eight ninety five. So our go gauge protrusion is going to be roughly one hundred twenty five thousandths, and like I mentioned, we got about two thousandths of crush. Everything's going to squeeze in together. So 
basically I stop at 125 and I inch in our final should be 123 so we will see this will be the measurement we're trying to aim for with the go gauge protrusion uh, we will see exactly what the final measurement is and we'll notate that and all of these measurements will be actually filed away on a PDF so if the client ever wants to build another barrel they don't have to send in their action to me I basically have all the measurements here and I'll build the, uh, the barrel to those specs all right so let's set up the barrel to the lathe and uh, go from there so we're going to utilize a four jaw chuck and this is basically how I get the barrel mounted onto the chuck I use something called a copper wire now this adds a pivot point to the barrel I situate this so I have enough barrel protruding outside the headstock here that gives me enough room uh, to cut off a little bit of the tenon here or the, uh, the breech end and not affect uh, basically uh, the clamping force being around the chamber anything near that chambering job so I'll have this thing sticking out roughly this much uh, the six arc will land about right here this will be right here so all the clamping force are actually uh, right in front of the chamber itself now um, just a little bit of pressure actually will uh, cause the stainless steel this is 416R stainless steel to actually crush a little bit so when you're putting, running your chamber reamer in there it in fact does kind of change the measurements as well um, the heat does play an effect of that so that's something else I monitor and I'll show you guys the process of that so what I like to do to get this kind of centered up um, I'll show you guys the process we'll put this uh, little copper ring like I said this is a 4 gauge solid copper ring this keeps it from marring the barrel as well. There we go. So that's what I do. All right. So on the breech end, here's a little tip to actually get your indications a little faster. I use a live center, and uh, that will get me centered up a little, a little better, a little more accurate. So I don't really have to play around with the jaws as much. Live center goes in there, kind of free floats in there, kind of holds the barrel as center as possible, and then I just lightly snug up the jaws. So up to this point, it's pretty standardized method about dialing a barrel to the lathe and indicating. There's a lot of videos out there, but this is where things start to get a little different for me compared to what I've seen. Now what I'm using here is a long reach dial indicator from Mitatoyo. Turn that light off. And I got the barrel dialed in. This is a 1 10 thousandths indicator. I'm going off the lands and groove. So I'm looking at how the needle fluctuates here. And it's going about 2 10 thousandths over 4 on each land. So that's as squared up as best as possible. I will be taking off about half an inch so we're not completely done yet here um, this is what I do now I get a dummy cartridge which here it is a six arc dummy cartridge with a 105 grain bullet in there and I see exactly kind of where my indication is going to be now I indicate the barrel exactly where the bullet the uh, ogive of the bullet will be engaging the lands uh, you want this bullet as best as possible to center up on the bore when it exits the cartridge so that's what I do. I have a long reach indicator. I said this is a Meta Toyo. I did slap on a longer reach. So actually this thing's a lot more sensitive than what it is. So it's basically half of one ten thousandths. Um, but as you can see here, I'm basically using the full reach of the actual indicator gauge. And that ball is right there where that bullet uh, enters the lands and grooves. So right there on the free bore. And that's exactly where I have this chamber indicated. Uh, we'll be taking another measurement again and centering up the barrel. Now on the outboard side, the spider side, I do have a 5 10 thousandths gauge. And what I do here is make sure that the, um, the OD of the barrel is not flux fluctuating a lot. This really reduces the vibration on the headstock. It gives a better chamber job. So we get rid of chatter and get a better chamber job. This is what I do here. Now the next step is finding the curvature of the bore. Now this is uh, where pre-fits and a hand-fitted operation are totally separate and this is the benefit of getting accuracy. Now if folks don't know, um, the bore of the rifle is never straight or very rare that it is straight. There's sometimes barrels out there that is for some reason 
are straighter than others. And nine out of 10 times, these barrels have somewhat of a, of a curvature. So when they actually bore the barrel and uh, before they actually put the lands in grooves, there is a slight curve. So it's kind of like digging land. If you plan on digging a, a tunnel underground, sometimes you get a soft spot, sometimes you get a hard spot, and that fluctuates how that, that bore is um, being, being drilled. So there's always a curvature to this, and the goal of this is to find exactly where that curve is. And since this is a long range rifle, I set the curvature at 12 o'clock. So you want it to aim up. And that benefits on, on uh, getting the action and your, your hand load is basically dialed in where you're only fighting gravity. Um, I've noticed when these curvatures are at a three or nine o'clock, well three and nine, uh, you start fighting striations and deviation when the barrel warms up. You start seeing your groups open up you know, horizontal. You'll get horizontal deviation. So this is kind of a bench rest style of chamber job. To find the curvature, this is what I do. This tool here is called a range rod. Now there is a grizzly rod and a range rod. The range rod is a tapered rod which will stop. Um, like I said, it's tapered. It'll stop on the, uh, the part where it starts to hit the lands of grooves. It is a piloted um, tool very precision ground and this is in my opinion what it's supposed to be used for a lot of folks use this um, what I've seen as a indicator for the actual chamber itself okay so this barrel is actually pretty straight the bore of this rifle uh, where I indicated on the chamber side you can barely see that needle moving so each one of those lines are five ten thousandths so we are roughly, let's see, at zero, five, one, five, almost two. So two thousandths of run out on the muzzle side here. So knowing that, let's find the high side. Let's spin this down. High side is going to be right here. So we will mark the barrel right at 12 o'clock. So when I basically cinch down this barrel, onto or so basically when I cinch down the action to this barrel I want that mark to be exactly at 12 o'clock so basically like that right that will be the high side the curvature of the bore is um, aiming at 12 o'clock so that's one of the differences that I do here so I won't give you all my trade secrets but that makes a huge difference on accuracy on your chamber job versus a pre-fit which you know you can headspace your barrel with a barrel nut or whatnot or screw down the barrel but you don't know where your high side is unless you got a lathe or a way to indicate your bore so that's what i do now let's set up the tenon job let's get cutting and i'll show you something else that i do all right um we're going to go ahead and cut off uh, about half an inch off the breech end here you have a parting tool this will get us a fresh lens and groove and we're at 70 rpm going. So just get some half an inch and start cutting basically. Alright. Alright, right, so I got the indicator back in here and it is exactly indicated again right about one ten thousandths. So it was off roughly one thousandths of an inch after cutting off that, uh, that little piece of uh, steel there. Um, the parting tool does exude a lot of pressure on the barrel, so it's always best to recheck. So there we go. I'm roughly, say, one ten thousandths, which is to be very suitable for getting an accurate inline chamber job. Okay, so the next thing I'll do now is actually pre-bore the chamber. What this allows me to do is get that reamer centered up as best as possible. Like I mentioned, uh, this thing is bowed, right? So if the reamer goes in, if the reamer goes in and it's got to follow that bore, what happens to the back end? Well, that starts to, when it gets to the end here, it's going to lift up. Now, I use a free floating reamer holder. So the reamer will start putting pressure upwards and cut a chamber that's going to be wider at the rear. And that causes a lot of slop, um, especially. Uh, for a, uh, a precision chamber job, you don't want a lot of excess slop in the rear. You want this cartridge to go in there as snug as possible uh, with factory ammo or your hand loads. So that's the difference basically, um, you know, production 
built rifles or rifles that are just basically trying to get busted out real quick and and get them done because there's a high demand for it they don't really take uh, this extra step and attention to detail um, for the simple fact that it does take time and time is money so let's get this thing pre-bored and uh go from there now the drill bit that i chose is about 20,000 short or thinner uh, than the od of the shoulder part and I'm only cutting about 75% of that whole cartridge length. So a little masking tape is a good indication of where to stop. And uh, I got here a nitride coated just drill bit. We'll be spinning this thing at 200 RPM. Obviously a little bit of drill fluid here, cutting fluid oil. Turn this on. some layout fluid and we're going to mark our tenon uh, overall length which is 895 thousandths. Yes I didn't face off this uh, just yet just because I'm going to kind of overshoot that and uh, yes this isn't a good thing to do with your calibers. So uh, just something simple I do. Quick little mark there. Now, this is basically going to be a really tight fit so here's a, another trick that I'm going to show you guys. Let me turn this down to where it just barely fits this recoil lock. Okay, so this thing is a extremely snug fit. It is sliding on there nice and tight. The next thing we'll do now is mark the threading. Um, this is kind of where this is all different. Now, now that we have this all super nice and tight, this thing is fully supported. Um, a lot of prefits or barrel manufacturers that do shoulder prefits will thread this tenon completely, leaving this thing to basically be kind of free floating in there. And we want everything to be rigid as possible. The more meat you can get around the bore uh, or the uh, free bore, basically, uh, where the bullet enters, um, the, the more it kind of dampens our harmonic. So that's the belief of this. And I've been personally seeing some accuracy improvements uh, doing this. So let's see here. We will see exactly what that is. 641,000. So we do know that our tenon needs to be 895. We are 5,000 short, so let me go ahead and cut down 5,000 more, 895.5, so right on the money basically. Our tenon is going to start at 645 basically. Okay, so I'm threading at 200 RPM and there is a little relief cut, we'll gauge the threads at 2 here. Get to where it just stops in there, back it out, and this should be roughly the last pass on this, and we'll see exactly where this uh, this action lines up. So that black mark you see here is the high side bore that I indicated. So let's give the action a thread. Let's see a little close up how the threads look at 200 RPM. Gives a nice, nice finish uh, compared to here. So. Alrighty. So the action's threaded on and the bolt still got some free play there. The high side mark is still off. I'm at a three o'clock. So I want to take off a little bit on the shoulder here. And uh, like I said, we got three thousandths to play. I should be able to time this right there at 12 o'clock and then we'll cut off or reface off the uh, back end to get the 895 dimension again. Here's a little close up of that full supported recoil lug. It, uh, right there fully supported so nice tight fit and um, you can see that the threads start right there and for final verification we're gonna make sure that the bolt really locks down all right to go over the chambering setup I'm using a bald eagle free-floating 
a, a reamer holder. So I basically will be holding this and feeling pressure. This allows me to feel if there's hard spots in the barrel. Um, I can basically control the feed with the, uh, the tailstock here. And I can slow down and speed up or whatever. Now you do notice I have this pan here and some oil. Now I'm using Hangster First 46 or PC 46. It's a specially designed reaming oil. I do have a bore through barrel flush system. This is from Cretan Rifles. So this is a outstanding upgrade uh, for this lathe. If you want a, I mean a 100% spectacular chamber job, this thing really, really is a huge upgrade for a lathe. Um, especially if you're gonna be doing this for business. Not only does it speed up your chambering job, it keeps the barrel nice and cool. It keeps your reamer nice and sharp. Um, it extends uh, the life of the reamer. Obviously, you do need a heavy duty pump. So what I have here down in the lathe is this big old massive 220 um, single phase uh, pump with a uh, seven gallon um, uh, oil catch there. So how this works, it's pretty loud. I got this set up. Let me just turn it on, get some some oil going through. This is my little shut off right here. You hear the oil, start seeing it drip out. And like I said, it's a continuous flow of oil. So let me get the chambering job done. I'll show you guys how it looks like afterward. And then we'll talk about some of the effects of how this thing is chambered and some of the benefits. All right, so basically halfway or about a quarter inch in, and you can see the chip flow there. Now uh, the difference between uh, reaming and chipping. So uh, this allows me to really feed in, especially with the bore through flush system and get some really nice chips. And I really want to pay attention to the chip flow. So we can finish this up. Okay, so the go gauge protrusion is roughly 125,000. So we should be right at headspace. We'll give this thing a try with the action now. All right, with the go gauge inserted, let's see where we're at. I don't think this is headspace yet. Nope, see there's locking up. So what we'll do is we'll back out the action here until the bolt just drops. There we go. And basically snug it up. And then we're gonna see what this gap is with feeler gauges. All right, so the feeler gauge that goes in there is eight thousandths. That puts it right with a little bit of tension. Right about there. And like I said, we got two thousandths crushed to accommodate. So we gotta chamber this another ten thousandths and that should be headspace. All right, here's the final headspace check here. So right at 8,000 more. And it's uh, go gauge is going in with very little resistance. So in fact, what I like to do, especially for uh, cartridges that are considered barrel burners, the six arc really isn't much of a barrel burner, but I do know that it does, um, uh, the accuracy does come into play when chambering these things at minimum. So for cartridges like the 6GT, the 6 Creedmoor, 6 Dasher, any of those high barrel burning cartridges, I chamber right at minimum, uh, which allows you to have more barrel life. So this is a difference between a hand fitted operation versus a pre-fit. Um, you know, in my opinion, a shouldered pre-fit is, you're, you're, you're basically rolling the dice, you're taking a gamble. Is it really headspace um, like I showed you? Uh, the difference between a couple actions uh, just going over this one versus the last one i did uh, there is some measurement differences and the difference between a go gauge and a no go gauge is four thousandths so you're really playing and rolling the dice um, are they that exact uh, exact not really i mean more, more than likely you there's a good chance and possibility that you could be overhead space or under head space regardless uh, like i said i set these things right at minimum so with a little bit of resistance here, right now I crush this thing down 2000s and get the, uh, the barrel, you'll see that this thing will have a little bit of resistance. So that'll be right at minimum headspace. Well, the chamber side is done. Uh, the breech end is all done, the tendon's done. So all I gotta do now is uh, remove the polish off the chamber side here. I'll use a 500 grit sandpaper. Uh, just remove some of that, that polish, give kind of a rough, a rough surface for the brass to adhere to. Um, you really don't want to polish a chamber, especially for high uh, PSI cartridges like this. You want the brass to do its job. So a little bit of a rough surface is ideal for a chamber. You want that brass to expand and grip the chamber walls. Um, and then obviously we'll radius the, the back end of the chamber here, give a, a good little polish on that side, just on the rim of that. That way it aids in, in defeating the, uh, the cartridge. So here's a breech end. Like I said, did a little chamfer job there. 
and did a little high polish on that that aids in feeding and um, you know a lot of uh, old school gunsmiths may say that or they may frown upon doing that uh, this is a recommendation from Zermatt and in fact this cartridge is still completely supported all the way down the back side if I get this thing to focus so you can see there that the uh, cartridge is still completely supported all the way down the body of the cartridge so even if this thing was to have a catastrophic failure I mean that was, that's basically the theory um, if you basically cut the edge off the, off the breech end here um, it you won't have a full case support but the way I chamber this thing and having that close of a, of a breech face clearance between the bolt and the uh, breech of the uh, barrel um, it allows me to do that little bit, little bit of a chamfer and get this thing to be fully case supported. So obviously this was a primed empty case. Anyways, let me show you guys what a good chamber job looks like. And starting from the breech end, you can see the scuffing that I did intentionally as to aid into uh, the actual cartridge to uh, adhere to the, the bare chamber walls. Uh, here is the shoulder and there is very, very minimal uh, tooling marks there. You see the reflection on the shoulder there. That's basically what this um, Hanks First 46 uh, Reamer oil does. Uh, we'll look into the neck area here. And you can see that's completely shiny as hell. A little bit of uh, scratches from removing the, um, the pilot there. So that's a, I had a very tight fitting pilot. Uh, and then we'll go to the free bore. So this is what really matters. So we want this thing as smooth as possible and as even as possible. So we'll look at all the lands of grooves. See that the free bore is nice and shiny. And all the lands and grooves are the same. So that means I had this barrel dialed in exactly one ten thousandths and everything seems to be very uniform so that is a excellent chamber job uh, no scoring um, free bore looks phenomenal this is where all the accuracy comes into play the little scratches you see here is uh, pretty much going to be polished away after a few firings and very minimal tooling marks even on the shoulder so the last step to do is obviously cut the muzzle and get a 5 inch 24 crown and I got the range rod dialed in and um, you can see here it's got barely one ten thousandths to run out so this is what the range rod is really meant to do and that's to basically dial in the bore and use for cutting the crown so as you can tell there it's it's running true as, uh, as heck now as far as the outboard side and uh, this is where we can verify the high side again you can see it's quite a bit off so High side right there, see? So there we go. So here's the completed rifle. hard work what does that give us well we guarantee these rifles to shoot half MOA or better and how do we do that pretty simple we test it downrange so I take every single one of our rifles unless the client specifically says not to shoot it we actually test these things downrange in the elements and we'll shoot factory ammunition through it and also do a load workup now I am one that does believe in a barrel breaking process that's just something I've done for years it you know has benefited me but one of the things that uh, I do that a little different that a lot of folks uh, you know consider a barrel break-in is I actually use a digital bore scope now this is an invaluable tool that I recommend this is made by Teslon this is a, um, a hard wire 30 inch rod from Teslon and what this helps me do is see exactly what's going on down the bore so what I like to do is through three initial shots get a zero going 
and I punch a, a patch down the bore, get some of the fouling out, and then check out the digital bore scope and see how that copper is building up. Now, believe it or not, there's been a few barrels that have actually returned, some high name brand barrels, you know, Bartline, Proof Research, uh, Benchmark, and I've actually seen copper around the middle of the actual bore itself. And that's where it's a, an unusual um, sign of copper buildup. It usually tells you that that's a high side or basically a tight spot in the bore, constricting the bullet, which in, inherently um, you know, kind of hurts your accuracy. So you should see a little bit of copper fouling within obviously the throat area when the bullet engages the lance. And then you should see copper fouling around three quarters of the bore all the way out the, the muzzle. So if you see any other copper fouling in between, um, that's usually a tight spot or some scarring down the bore. So like I mentioned, a digital bore scope is a, an invaluable tool, highly recommend it. I'll put a link in the description below, check it out. And um, between shots, I'll do three shot groups and uh, clean in between, uh, punch a patch through the bore and use some Hoppies Elite, get some of the copper removed out of there and see how it builds up. So 100 yards, let's see what this thing does. And it looks like we're on paper. Low six o'clock. So let's just shoot for a group. Do three shots here. All right. All righty, looking pretty promising. So first three shots out of the barrel. That looks like a half inch group with factory ammunition. So awesome. So let's get that zeroed. There we go. All right, so definitely uh, the last, or these two groups here, there was some um, stacking right here and had one weird little flyer that went over here, but uh, this was stacking on top of each other. And then the next one was 15 thousands off the lands, and um, that was in a pretty impressive group. I think that's actually six shots, but pretty impressed with that group size. Um, I then went to 10 thousands uh, off the lands, which is up here, and then, um, five thousands off the land so it started to come back together but fifteen thousands i think that would be the the group size for this rifle so like i said um you know we load develop while we're breaking in the barrel uh, we do shoot factory ammunition as well these were the hornady blacks looks like the first three hornady blacks were doing actually not bad at all and um and then we shot a grant again over here and then we shot the 103 grain precision hunters which shot like crap give us a dice <laughs> Um, I then shot some hand loads. Um, this was basically uh, the first initial hand loads being um, 30 thousandths off the lands. I then, then decided to do um, some Hornady Blacks again, uh, just to see where I'm at on the zero. So these were the Hornady Blacks. They had two, some, two outliers here. And uh, then I had two um, 
well, it looks like three or four, all in the same whole clover leaf in here. So after that was just a matter of low development. So that's essentially what we do, um, or what I basically do. I'm building these rifles. Um, I, I clean you know, the barrel within five shots. Oh, every five shot group, I inspect the bore with the with the bore cam, and uh, punch patch through there. Get all the carbon fouling out. Um, throw some hoppies elite. Get a little bit of that copper fouling out, and then punch it again. Dry patches. And then go for groups again so not bad let me know what you guys think that is the process of building an accurate rifle of what i do so um you know difference between a hand fitted rifle versus a pre-fit you know the biggest benefit to it the fact is uh, at least for me and our company uh, we will build a rifle and we'll guarantee these things to shoot accurate we'll give you the load data so all you got to do is buy the rifle and load the ammo exactly how we loaded it up and then go have fun so that really saves you a lot of time at the range you know trying to figure out what works for your rifle you have something that works already and you can go basically go punch some steel zero out and then go shoot some steel long range well folks let me know what you think comment below as always stay safe like share subscribe and i'll catch y'all on the next video thanks for watching